Let's talk now about the state of our economy when it comes to pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. This is a common narrative. Uh, we know the streets here may not be paved with gold, but most of us in this country were taught that hard work, diligence, and persistence have always been the most important keys to success. Well, that view is being challenged in a major way by one of this country's most prominent economists, Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz. In his new book, he argues the inequality gap in this country has gotten so large that the chances of those at the bottom making it to the middle or the top are now very low, lower even than they were in old Europe, even if they study hard in school and work hard at their jobs. Stiglitz's new book is titled The Price of Inequality, How Today's Divided Society Endangers Our Future, and here he is describing what he means. So the life chances, chances of somebody from the top who doesn't do very well in school are better than somebody from the bottom who does well in school. So that really says, you know, that your parents make a great deal of difference to your economic fortunes. We're not the land of opportunity. All right, so let's talk about this notion that the United States of America isn't that land of opportunity we thought it once was. And to help me break this down is Richard Wolf, author of the book Occupy the Economy, Challenging Capitalism. Well, hello there, Richard. Um, let me get your take. I mean, do you agree with this notion that it matters much more who your parents are than how hard you work? Yes, I agree. It's becoming worse. But you know, it's been true here in the United States for quite a while. Uh, we have a very elaborate mythology about people having all kinds of chances. But when you look hard at the statistics, you really don't see that. You are pretty well constrained in the United States. Uh, by where you're born and who you're lucky to have as parents or not so lucky. But, but Stiglitz is right, it is getting worse as the gap between rich and poor in the United States keeps widening beyond that, really, that we've ever seen before for at least 100 years. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I see these news stories and read these articles about people, especially, you know, higher income people in New York City and other cities around this country, uh, fighting to the, get their child into uh, a certain kindergarten, that, that they're worried that where their child goes to kindergarten will affect where they go to college. And guess what? It turns out in some cases uh, they might be right. Yes, it's a whole pattern, you know. Once upon a time, Americans worried about what their child would get in the way of a college. Then it became what kind of private school to get you into the college. And it keeps on going until it becomes what's your toddler's play school to get you in to the system where you will then end up. But the underlying reality is there are so few good jobs, good income situations left as the country produces most of its goods in poor countries around the world, as we outsource more and more decent jobs, we're left with a population whose real opportunities are shrinking and a population that was never trained to expect this. So we have this disjunction and it's always what happens in a society as it begins to fall apart and the stresses and strains become part of the culture. I think it's a really good point, and I think we can't talk about that and make your point without bringing in uh, China. I know I, I've read various reports that show about three million jobs have been wiped out of this country uh, just since 2001, and, and it's directly related to the growing U.S.-China trade deficit. So, you know, we've got less being exported, more being imported, and out of those jobs, more than half of them were in manufacturing. Uh, I'm wondering, Richard, I mean, do you think that there's a way to break this pattern or at least slow it down? Not in the foreseeable future. We've basically had 20 to 25 years of mostly American corporations seeking to make more money by moving production from American workers to cheaper foreign workers. What has even accelerated the problem is in the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years, white collar jobs, not just manufacturing, but clerical jobs, jobs where you need an education, are also being outsourced, particularly, for example, to India. And so you have a combination of blue and white collar jobs that Americans trained for, went to school for, uh, prepared for, but they're just not there. And there's a kind of social disorientation as the impact 
of this move by corporations to make more money at the expense of the American people sinks into the consciousness of our people. Uh, and, you know, let's talk about those corporations. I mean, uh, corporate profits right now are skyrocketing. And, and we see this in, in a couple different ways. Uh, in the last 30 years, the share of national income held by the top 1% of Americans has actually doubled. And for the top 0.1%, their share has tripled. Meanwhile, when we look at, you know, the middle class and median incomes for Americans, American workers, uh, those have stagnated. For some families, uh, they've seen their wages go down. Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, you talk about sort of uh, the, the push and pull, the tug of war of what's going on here, but go into a little bit of detail here. Well, I think what you see is a movement of jobs out of the United States. The end result isn't complicated. More and more Americans discover that the jobs are just not there, and they ratchet down their expectations. They persuade themselves to accept a job below what they're trained for, with an income that's less secure, that has fewer benefits, and so you see a sliding downward in the standard of living of American workers. The corporations, however, have a different story. They're the beneficiaries. They're the ones whose profits go up because they've moved work to cheaper workers in another country. And so you get this disjunction where the corporations and the people rich enough to have stocks and bonds in those corporations do very well, the 1%, and the rest of us struggle in a downward tide that affects all of us and that keeps separating uh, so that that, you know, the statistics I tell my students, 30 years ago, the United States was a less unequal country than most of Europe. Now we've leapfrogged over Europe and become more unequal than any other invest industrial advanced country. And for the American people, brought up with the notion of equality, of free opportunity, if you work hard, you'll make it, it's very hard psychologically as well as practically to cope with a situation as downward facing as this one is. Well, it's tough, Richard, because, you know, on one hand, it's very hard to fault businesses, even some of these big corporations. Corporations for wanting to make more money. But uh, what's it going to take? I mean, what if, I think this seems very unlikely, but I'm going to say it anyways. I mean, what if we had a couple CEOs of major corporations who said, you know what, I'm going to strive to make $100 million. And after I make $100 million for my cor corporation, everything else I make, I'm going to reinvest into more jobs. You know, I have my yachts. I have my, you know, 14 houses. Everything I make, I'm going to reinvest. Why aren't there more, you know, heads of corporations who say, I'm going to stop and, and keep everything here in this country? Well, you know, in some countries they do that. Germany, for example, which is doing much better than the United States in this current economic crisis, has very strict rules about when a company can leave. They do not have the freedom American companies have to get up and go and yet they're doing very well. It's the culture. It's a question of whether the working classes, the unions, the socialist, communist movements are strong enough to impose limits and constraints. When they are, businessmen and women often kind of adopt the mentality you're talking about, a culture in which they can't just do what makes the most profits. They also have to weigh against that what the social consequences are, and if those are bad for huge numbers of people, they can't go in that direction. We haven't done that in this country. And now we're suffering the consequences of having destroyed our left. We have no social force that reigns in the kind of acquisitive, accumulative mentality that governs our corporations and explains why so few of them will do what you just said. Yeah, Germany is such a good example to bring up there. So many of their biggest companies have, uh, you know, the right. workers that sit on the boards with these CEOs. There's just not as much of a disconnect between them. Always good to have you on. Richard Wolf, author of the book Occupy the Economy, Challenging Capitalism.